Um, yeah, so I'm uh, also really excited to introduce our next speaker, Francis Chu. So Francis uh, is in my group at the IPI. She joined last summer and uh, yeah, really made a remarkable amount of progress in a very short period of time. So Francis is going to tell you about her second project tonight. So uh, Francis, take it away. Cool. Um, thanks for the introduction. So today I'll be talking about designing CK receptor inhibitors to clear hematopoietic stem cells um, prior to bone marrow transplants. So CK receptors are present on the surface of hematopoietic stem cells and they are dimerized by their ligand um, stem cell factor and it's also a receptor tyrosine kinase. So hematopoietic stem cells give rise to all types of blood cells and the dimerization of CKIT promotes hematopoietic stem cell survival, proliferation, and differentiation. So if we use um, designed proteins to bind the same spot as stem cell factor, we can prevent CKIT receptors from dimerizing and this can be useful to clear hematopoietic stem cells before um, bone marrow transplants. So we need um, these design proteins because current methods to clear hematopoietic stem cells are harmful to patients. So on the left, we see a patient that has a, a blood disease caused by abnormal hematopoietic stem cells. And to clear these before a bone marrow transplant, um, currently chemotherapy or radiation is used. And afterwards, um, healthy hematopoietic stem cells from a donor will be transplanted into the patient. And the purpose of these design proteins is to replace this step, which um, is harmful. So I had two design approaches to prevent CKIT dimerization. The first was to keep the overall structure of stem cell factor, its ligand, um, but just mutate the residues at the dimer interface to create an inhibitor. And the second strategy was to design a de novo protein that binds to the same spot as stem cell factor on CKIT. Um, today, I'll just be talking about this first strategy. So here's the structure of stem cell factor in green bound to CKIT in gray, just the ectodomain portion. And the dimer interface is in the middle of the two. And these are homodimers. Um, they're just colored in different shades to show the different chains. So to break the dimer of stem cell factor, we first had to identify the dimer interface shown in magenta. And for this method, um, I created a general method to disassemble catenary structure. The first step of this method is to design the residues at the interface to increase monomer stability and decrease the potential of binding and creating the dimer. So to do this, I used fast design um, and the input was just the stem cell factor dimer. The first step was to select the residues at the interface. So to do this, I used the interface by vector selector to select the interface between the two stem cell factor chains. And then I also used a layer selector to just select the surface residues. And to get the intersection of these two residue selectors, I used a logic selector. And this is a selector that I wrote um, and it can evaluate multiple booleans in the selector option. So for example, if we wanted to get this um, Boolean logic here, not selector one and not selector two, or selector three and selector four in parentheses, 
um, if we were to use not and or, or selectors in Rosetta, it would take up a lot of lines of code and you can only do one like Boolean logic per selector. Um, so with the logic selector, you can put all of the um, Boolean logic inside the selector option. And my mentor, Jared um, Adolf Brifogel actually made it possible to do Boolean logic in any selector option in Rosetta. Um, I just wrote the logic selector so that you wouldn't have to use one of the and or or not selectors if you wanted to do some logic and assign a name to it. So after selecting the interface, um, then the next step was to delete one of the chains. So now we just have one chain of the stem cell factor um, and the interface of that chain is selected. And then afterwards, fast design was used to design the selected interface residues. So fast design was passed uh, some layer design restrictions which are present in the task operations section. So I designed these interface residues to be um, residues that are found on the surface of proteins. And I restricted the boundary to repacking, prevented every other portion of the protein from repacking and only allowed design at the interface. Which is shown here. And so after fast designing, I had 74 unique designs from 2,500 runs. And so all of them converged at these 74 sequences. So the next step was to choose the best designs out of the 74 that came out of fast design. And to do this, I wanted to analyze the dimer binding energy of the designs and then choose the ones that were least likely to form a dimer, so most likely to stay in the monomeric state. So to do this, I used BioPython and the um, PDB parser and superimposer. And as inputs, I had the monomeric design and also the wild type dimer. So the first step was to make a copy of the dimer of the monomer design. So there are two copies and then superimpose both of these onto the wild type dimer to recreate the dimer. And then finally output a PDB of the dimerized, redimerized design. So with these dimerized designs, I use the interface analyzer mover in Rosetta and I packed the input and pack separated. So this was to get the um, change in energy of binding, um, DG separated shown on the X axis. So this is the change in energy upon dimer formation. And then I plotted that against the DG mutation, which is the change in the total score of the monomer state after design. So all of these designs were more stable as a monomer than the native shown in green. And um, they also all had worse um, change in energy of binding or dimer formation. So they're all more likely to form a monomer um, as calculated by Rosetta. So I decided to set a cutoff at zero for the binding energy because I really wanted designs that wouldn't form a dimer. And then I chose some designs to order. So I chose a design that had the lowest DG mutation. So it should have um, the most stability in the monomer form. Um, I chose another design here. Um, that had the highest DG separated, so least likely to form a dimer. And then based on sequence diversity, I just chose three more designs to order. And these designs that I chose um, highlighted are the residues that were mutated. And it seems like a lot of the nonpolar, um, the uncharged polar residues were 
mutated to charged residues and also the um, nonpolar residues were mutated to charged residues. And so at this point I expressed and characterized the designs that I chose. So for these five designs, um, I chose to express them in mammalian cells because they are naturally glycosylated and have multiple disulfide bonds. So mammalian cells are better equipped to um, handle these. And also they can um, add post-translational modifications to proteins. So for the vector, um, I had some an N-terminal fusion, starting with a signal peptide to secrete the design proteins into the supernatant, and then a flag tag for detection, a 10-his tag for purification, um, and then siderocalin, which is just there to increase expression of the protein, and some protease sites to cut off these, um, this tag later on. Um, and an AVI tag for biotinylation for experiments downstream as well. So I ended up ordering the ectodomain of the CKIT receptor, um, the wild type dimer stem cell factor, and then the five designs. So the first thing I did was order these designs and the wild types. And then they were transfected into 30 mil cultures of XP293 cells. Um, after they were ready to har be harvested, um, they were purified using immobilized metal affinity chromatography. And for fear further purification, I used size exclusion chromatography. So from size exclusion chromatography, um, proteins of different sizes will elute at different times from the column. So larger proteins will usually elute earlier and smaller proteins will elute later. So here in um, black is the dimer of wild type stem cell factor and in red is the CKIT receptor. So they're about the same um, size. And this is one of the first designs. Um, it seemed to elute later than the wild type and the other designs in green and blue um, also eluded later. So this is just preliminary data and we would need to use a more like accurate way to um, measure the protein size and solution. So we would use SecMols later on, but this um, shows that there's something different about the monomers and their size. Possibly. So going back to the designs I chose, um, the design in red with the lowest DG mutation um, was not well expressed. So it was not measured by size exclusion chromatography as in the same thing happened with the design in pink um, all the way to the right was also not well expressed. But the three um, in blue, green, and yellow in the middle um, were expressed high enough to be measured from size exclusion chromatography. So maybe there needs to be a balance between the chain, the um, stability of the monomer form and also like the potential to form a dimer. So finally, I cleaved off the N-terminal fusion to just obtain the designs. And I wanted to test if the designs had properly folded disulfide bond, formed disulfide bonds. Um, in the wild type stem cell factor in green, there are two disulfide bonds per stem cell factor. And with the monomer, um, I'd expect that the disulfides are conserved. And to test if they're properly folded, we did a SDS page gel with and without DTT. So if the disulfides are formed correctly, then we'd expect there to be a shift um, 
af before and after treating with DTT, which breaks the disulfide bonds and causes the um, denatured proteins to move, migrate differently through the gel. So um, here in the first lane, first two lanes is C kit, then followed, following is the wild type stem cell factor, um, and then my three designs. So the designs seem to shift in a similar way as the wild type. So I'd um, conclude that they are formed. Um, there also seemed to be some degradation product likely due to the presence of a protease, but we're still working on addressing that for future purifications. And also wanted to see if there were similar glycosylation patterns in the designs as compared to the wild type. So um, here on the left in green is again the wild type stem cell factor and in orange is the designs. So there are N-linked um, glycosylation sites where the motif is an asparagine followed by any residue, then serine or threonine. So from previous studies, um, they found that the location in magenta is fully glycosylated. Um, the two locations in cyan are sometimes glycosylated and then this black um, asparagine between the two dimers are, or the two stem cell factors in the dimer are unglycosylated. So again, um, I did an SDS page gel with and without the treatment of PNGase, which is an enzyme that cleaves and linked glycans. So first we have um, C-kit, which is also glycosylated, um, stem cell factor, the wild type, and then my three designs. So before treatment with PNGase, there's this smeary band caused by different molecular weights um, due to different, slightly different glycosylation. So after treatment with PNGase, we'd expect that this band collapses into one at a lower molecular weight. And this seemed to happen for all of them and the shifts before or the bands before and after are at similar locations on the gel. So it seems that they have similar glycosylation patterns as compared to the wild type. So um, next I will be performing characterization experiments on the designs. So to test for thermostability, um, they should be thermostable at 37 degrees Celsius which is body temperature because they're being planned on using, um, we're planning to use them as a therapeutic possibly. And to test the thermostability, we'll use differential scanning ferrimetry to get the um, melting temperature. And we also want to measure the molecular weight and size of the designs um, using size exclusion chromatography with multi-angle light scattering. So the design should be around half the molecular weight as the wild type um, stem cell factor to confirm that they're actually um, monomers. And then finally, to make sure that the designs are properly folded, um, we'd want to get their secondary structures using circular dichrism spectroscopy and the design should have the same secondary structure as the wild type because um, nothing changed other than residues in the loop. So other than that, the tertiary stru structure should be the same. And then finally, functional assays will be performed. Um, we want to conserve the binding to C kit of the designs. So to test this, we'll use biolayer interferometry or BLI. And the design should still be able to bind C-kit because the locations where it was mutated in magenta do not overlap with the binding interface shown in cyan. So the binding interface should still be able to bind the C-kit receptor and inhibit um, SCF from binding. And then finally, um, testing these in stem cells um, that display C-kit 
So adding the design should decrease the number of viable stem cells and progenitor cells. And I just have some acknowledgements. Um, I'd like to thank the whole lab, especially Chris um, for help with this entire project, um, Jared for teaching me a bunch of Rosetta, um, James for teaching me everything in wet lab and Ian and Ben for help with purifying proteins. Questions for, for Francis. I could probably think of some. Maybe like if you were to revisit the computational protocol. Um, do it over again, like on a new project with the same goal of uh, make a different protein that you're trying to inhibit dimerization of. Can you think of anything you would modify in the methodology you took? Or maybe how you chose which designs you would uh, try to express? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that I would try to do the entire protocol in Rosetta in one script. Um, the way I did it this in this um, presentation was I got designs out of Rosetta, um, had to realign them in BioPython, and then re-evaluate them at the end with another Rosetta script. So I think doing like a multi-stage type protocol would just be a lot less work um, on that's not like in a just one protocol that you can use, um, a protocol that you can just run like from start to finish and not have to worry about going in in between and moving over files um, and using different softwares. So could you that. comment on the balance? Thanks a lot for that answer. Could, could you also yeah. comment on just the balance of how much time you spend on the computational component versus the experimental part? Seems like the experimental part is much more well, maybe I don't really know both sides of the story. I'm more of a computational person, but you did both in this project, so be curious. Yeah, the computational part was a lot less work that I had to do, um, like on my end, I guess, because I had this protocol and I would just run a bunch of structures and um, then use a script to run through all of the structure, all of the output structures. So um, yeah, and I guess there wasn't as much troubleshooting involved as in the experimental side. Um, with purifying protein, there was some unexpected things that happened and debugging, I guess, in the wet lab is a lot slower than computationally. So. Thanks. I guess if I could jump in, um, the your 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 plot there where you showed all your computational designs. Um, I guess the two that didn't work experimentally, if I understood correctly seem like they were in one dimension, similar quality to the ones that did work and much better um, in the other dimension. Um, and the fact that they're kind of out there on their own makes me, I guess it doesn't surprise me that much, but I guess maybe it should, um, you know, kind of naively. Did you kind of look at those designs and see if there was something about them that was, um, like was Rosetta doing something that was, um, if you look back on it as like, oh yeah, that it, it Rosetta did something that didn't make a whole lot of sense. And that's why the score shifted so much, but um, that didn't work in real life. 
Yeah, um, that's a good point. I didn't exactly go back and look at the structures, um, but it does seem like, so we have zero to 530 and then I think what's the other one. Um, one, five, two, eight. Yeah, so I guess one thing I was looking at was this proline here um, for structure of the loop, but it seems like the other designs as well um, mutated this residue. So it seems like there's not an, like a difference that's sticking out to me from these designs, but it does seem like they're very far from the other designs. So it could just be an artifact of some sort or, yeah, definitely something to look into. And also strange that they're so far from the rest of the designs. Yeah, it might be interesting to see if, if there's something that could be like down the road, you could think of a filter to kind of catch that kind of thing, but yeah, thanks. All right, well, there's no other questions for Francis. Uh, thanks again uh, to, to her and, and uh, to Dylan, both of our speakers tonight. Really excellent seminars. Uh, and uh, thanks everybody for, for sticking around. And this was a bit of a longer session tonight, but uh, yeah, really enjoyed it. <laughs>